Okay, well, why don't I um, just begin now? Let me just change my screen so you can uh, see what I'm looking at. Let's find it here. So let me, um, I'll just start off nice and simple here. Um, really what I'm um, going to talk about is uh, uh, what strategy uh, you should use going forward or how you th should think about going forward so that the next time um, we make it through. So uh, the first uh, thing that we have to sort of get out of the way is, uh, well, you didn't make it, but uh, the big question is by how much and what sections, because that'll determine uh, what your strategy is going forward. So let's just look at some um, sample results and uh, we'll interpret these results. And the results that I've uh, selected are, are uh, not very good at all. Uh, so we'll get an idea of, uh, uh, of how we would deal with results like this. And I, I chose these because these are, are fairly poor results overall. Um, but I just want to show you how to interpret this so that you have um, a strategy to think about this. If we look at the first uh, um, graph up here, we have our minimum passing score in the middle. Notice uh, that this is somewhere between uh, the minimum passing score and the 10th percentile. Those uh, dots at the bottom are the 10th percentile. So this is, um, this is not a good performance. And if you look at the uh, size of the blue box, it does not breach the minimum passing score at all. So this was somebody who was very unprepared for the exam. Uh, and if they felt that they were prepared, then they prepared the wrong way uh, or they thought about it the wrong way. But let's uh, just dig a little deeper and see how we could, uh, if we were this person, how we could help this person. What these blue boxes tell us down here, uh, if we look at the bottom chart, what the blue boxes tell us is that on any given day, if they had taken the exam again on any given day, that their score would have ranged somewhere within that blue box. So if we take the 70% line and we just have a look at where they breached the 70% line, we can see uh, that this person had six of the 10 that just out of random chance, uh, if they had been given another exam with different questions, uh, there's a good probability they would have breached the 70% mark on those six sections. So those appear to be their strongest sections, even though we look down at the 50% line on some of these, quant was 50%. Portfolio management, notice it just almost made it. Uh, same with fixed income, it just almost made it. Uh, economics is well over the 50%. Corporate finance, that was a winner uh, right there. And of course, alternative investments is way up there as well. So as far as a strategy going back, um, I'm going to ask uh, people out there if they could just keep their uh, microphones muted because I get a lot of feedback when your microphones are on. So on this one here, um, again, it's, uh, it shouldn't be uh, uh, demoralizing to get results like this because if you look at uh, how many peaked over the 70%, that's not bad. It's not as if, well, listen, you're not going to make it. It's not bad. Uh, there are some sections that need to be picked up, uh, equity, uh, ethics, uh, FRA, etc. But overall, uh, what looks like it could be bad is not really that bad when you look at a perspective of randomness. So what uh, um, what's going on in in these particular results is one of three things: uh, a lack of time to prepare, uh, a lack of understanding, or a lack of strategy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about all three of those things. So let's go back to the um, first screen and let's uh, attribute our performance to something because this is how we can fix it if we if we know exactly what our problem was at least we can work to fix it so let's talk about uh, uh, time and let me find my notes here um, clearly more time is better than less time now the thinking level two is uh, level one is um, fairly straightforward. Actually, when you look back on level one later on, you'll realize how easy level one uh, is. Level two is quite challenging overall. Level three is, I think, the easiest of the three levels in terms of the cognitive load for understanding the content. The exam is a little bit different than, uh, than level one and two, but as far as understanding the content, it's the easiest level. Uh, there's sort of a general rule of thumb about 300 hours per level. But that 300 hours 
uh, is for somebody who is A, willing to put in 300 hours, and B, has at least an average ability. By average ability, I mean that in university, in their undergrad, um, they, they were at the average of the class or above. If uh, you were at the average or below, then that's going to be more than 300 uh, hours. Uh, the higher above the average are, the more standard deviations above the average you are, the less than 300 hours that you need because you learn faster. You can absorb uh, information faster. So time, if, we, if you ask the 60 or the 55 percent that failed at level two because the pass rate was 45 percent and the 57 percent who failed at level one because the pass rate was 43 percent what their biggest uh, problem was uh, it will be lack of time they ran out of time they had to let some things go at the end uh, they were two weeks out from the exam there were three sections left to do and they just all they could do is watch videos and they really couldn't do very much work on it because they ran out of time time is the biggest one uh, no one will ever say, oh, you know why I failed? I simply had far too much time to prepare. No one will ever say that. It's always, uh, I didn't have enough time. Uh, so you need two things uh, when you have time. You need, number one, discipline. You've got to set aside time uh, for this. Simple as that. Uh, it's only August now. Some of you may be writing in the December exam for level one or uh, in the June exam. So you might feel that, well, for June, I got a lot of time. And that's the trap, is you feel you have a lot of time. You uh, fall victim to what's called the planning fallacy, uh, where you think that something can be done in less time than it really would take to be done, or that you can learn something in less time than it really does take to learn. Uh, so the more time you give yourself, the better uh, the better off you're going to be, but you need that discipline. So you got to look at the calendar. You got to say, okay, what hours of the week am I going to set aside for this? And that's it. That those are firm hours that are non-negotiable in my life. Uh, and if you set aside eight hours a week, I think for the next uh, 40 weeks, because that's basically what you have is about 40 weeks. If you set aside eight hours for the next 40 weeks, that's 320 hours. Uh, so it sounds like a lot, eight hours a week for 40 weeks, but that only brings you to 320 hours. And most people say, you know, 300 hours is about the average that most people study for, for, for uh, level one or two. So just look at the calendar and figure out where am I going to put those eight hours? And it's best if you don't put eight hours all at one time. Uh, your study session shouldn't be more than two, uh, two and a half hours tops. So if you're going to go two hours, you're going to want to set aside four blocks in the week where you put two hours aside for this and you stick with it. That's your discipline. Um, the other thing you need is motivation, is uh, motivation to get you to that every single week. Uh, and I try to help out on that as much as possible. Uh, I put out weekly videos, uh, weekly updates for level one, level two, and level three. And I always start off with how much time is left, how much you have to do, if you haven't started now, this is what you have to do. So I try to keep up on that as best I can. But you really got to bring that to the game. You got to bring discipline and you got to bring motivation. The calendar is there. Time is already here for you, uh, but you got to bring those two things. Um, and it does require sacrifice. You have to be willing to sacrifice something. If we think of, and listen, most of the world is still... Uh, uh, religious to some degree, or believe in a God, or have some Bible, and no matter what religious text you look at, there are always people in them asking their God for something, and in return they make a sacrifice, whether it be a, a goat, a cow, a, a lamb, a sheep, whatever, they make a sacrifice. Well, that's a story. That's a story saying that if you ask for something, it can be granted if you're willing to sacrifice. So you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to sacrifice to have this granted to me, to have a pass granted to me? What am I willing to sacrifice? And yeah, it's going to be eight hours of your life uh, every week or, or 10 hours if you need more time. If you're if you find some sections challenging, everything requires a sacrifice, but everything can be granted if you're willing to sacrifice. So time is your friend right now. Here's the thing about um, life. This is the funny thing about life. We like to think that as humans, we are all created equally, um, but we're not. We are created most unequal. Some are faster, some are slower, some are smarter, some are not. Some are taller, shorter, 
heavier, thinner, better looking, not so good looking. Some have better personalities, some are not. We are created most unequal. But the one thing that we are all equal on is time. Nobody has more time in a day. Everybody has 60 minutes in an hour. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. What sets us apart are not the things that we are different on. What sets us apart is the thing that we are the same on, and that's time and how we choose to spend our time. It makes all the difference. You can overcome almost anything if you're willing to spend more time bettering or, or preparing yourself for something better than somebody else's. So the one thing that we are all equal on is the greatest divider in the world, is time and how we choose to spend it. So um, there's time. Let's go to understanding. Here's the problem with, uh, with understanding. Um, it's big. There's a lot to cover at level one and level two. And sometimes you feel that you don't have the time to do these deep dives. That, look, I just got to get through this. And there's a lot of prep courses out there that focus on the highlights. Here's what you need to know for LOSA. Here's the formula. Here you go. And they'll print a formula on the screen. And they'll say, so if this variable equals this and this variable equals that, and they plug in all the numbers and come up with an answer and make it look really easy. Uh, well, listen, I can give a formula to somebody in grade nine, and I can give them the values for each of the variables, and somebody in grade nine can solve it. That doesn't mean they understand what they did. That doesn't mean they understand when to use the formula or what the formula is for or why that formula came about. It just means they know how to plug in numbers. And I've watched, I think, almost every prep provider's videos, uh, whether they be on YouTube or uh, um, um, I've come across them in, in, other, uh, in other ways. I've watched a lot. And I see a lot of that going on uh, where it's just, look, here's what you need to know to pass the exam. And that's the wrong way to think about it. Because if you're given a question that asks uh, 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 you to solve something in just a slightly different way, where you have a choice between two or three formulas that you have to pick, well, how are you going to pick which one? All you know how to do is plug in numbers into a formula. You haven't decided which one to use. So I focus, when I do this, I focus on understanding everything. And when you understand it, you don't have to memorize it. You can't memorize your way through level one and level two. You have to reach for understanding. And in the end, listen, uh, you can't memorize your way through your career. Uh, if you're going to be the best at this, if you're going to be in the top, because only the top survive, if you're going to be in the top, you have to know it better than the person beside you. So you're not in competition with 70%. You're not in competition with a minimum passing score. You're in competition with everybody sitting in that room. It's not enough just to say, look, I got to pass this exam. It's a chess game, and you got to play three, four moves ahead. you got to say, no, no, the exam is this move. My career is three moves ahead. I have to position myself for my career three moves ahead. The better I know this stuff, the better I will be in my career. The uh, content in the CFAI textbooks is not like an ordinary textbook. If you compare, let's take all the fixed income chapters from level one, level two, and level three, and make one book with just fixed income, and compare it with an academic textbook. Uh, the CFA textbook would be far more applied to the real world, less theoretical and far more applied. So the stuff you're learning in these readings is the stuff that actually happens out there in the real world. It's not theoretical stuff. It's the real stuff. So the better you know this stuff, the better you will be later on. So you need to set yourself up for something in the future and not just look at today's exam and say, well, I just got to get through this exam. If you stop focusing on passing the exam, and you start focusing on, look, all I want to do is just understand this content and that's it. Uh, the passing the exam will just happen on its own. It's much like uh, people who chase money. They'll never get it because they don't realize that money's the reward. It's not the goal. Uh, the goal is to be great at what you do. Money will be the reward. Uh, the goal is to understand the content. Passing the exam is the reward. Uh, so you have to, when you... Uh, come to a particular section, it's not enough to say, well, do I need to memorize this formula? And you memorize the formula. It's like, well, hang on a second. Where's this formula come from? How did it come to be? Uh, can, I, can I replicate the formula if I couldn't see it? If I had to just think about how that formula came to be, could I arrive at it just with logic? And many formulas in, in the CFA are pure logical conclusions to just thinking through the problem, especially in derivatives. Derivatives is nothing more than time value of money. 
And if you think about derivatives problems as time value of money, they become so simple and so easy to understand. Um, so uh, again, uh, just to highlight uh, uh, for understanding, you can't memorize your way through this. It's too big. And here, uh, uh, and here's the thing. At level three, that's not going to work because you have an AM session, which does not have multiple choice anymore. It asks you a question. It says, discuss the difference between these two things. You turn the page and it's just a blank sheet. That's it. And you got to start writing. Uh, so you can't read the question, look at three answers and say, well, okay, I can eliminate this. And now I got a 50-50 chance so I can guess. It looks like this could be the answer. You can't do that at level three. You really have to know it. Uh, so the better foundation you build at one and two, three becomes uh, much easier. Uh, so um, yeah, beware of these crash courses because the, the word, the, the stress I believe is on crash. You're going to crash uh, in these courses because they don't give you the depth of understanding that you need. Uh, you need to know why something is the way it is, not just how to use a formula, but why that formula is the way it is. And again, um, this journey is not just three exams. Uh, it's a super competitive industry that you're entering and only the best survive. So you want to position yourself for that. Finally, let's talk about strategy uh, and uh, um, what we spend our time on. For preparing for this exam, what you want to do is you want to spend as much of your cognitive energy uh, on learning the content and understanding the content and not on administrative tasks. And this is these when I say administrative tasks, uh, highlighting things in your book, uh, making notes on the side, having a sheet of paper where you stop and you're going to make your own notes on the side. Uh, most students will say, but that actually helps me. There is no evidence that that works. There has been a lot of research done on whether note taking actually improves your performance. And there is no conclusion on that. There is no evidence at all. No results are statistically significant between a group of students that make their own notes versus a group of students that were given the notes. So how the research works is you take two classes taking the same course. And in one class, um, the professor gives out all the PowerPoints and all of the, uh, all of the uh, slides at the beginning of the semester so that the student doesn't have to make their own. In the other course, the student doesn't, doesn't get that. They have to make their own. As they're listening, they have to write down their own notes. And then they look at the performance on the exams and the average of the classes. No difference. None. The students that were given the PowerPoints don't have to waste their time writing down. They can spend more time actually listening to what's being said. Those writing are too busy writing and missing what is being said because they got to write that last sentence down before they forget it. So making notes versus having notes, there is no statistical difference in performance between them, but you will spend a lot of time making notes. Well, get rid of that time. Uh, so um, for our... Uh, our packages, we include the notes now. So you get you get our notes uh, and we're converting them all to searchable text. So right now they're not searchable text, but they will be searchable text. So you get them all. Uh, don't, don't brush those aside. Don't say, oh, well, I'm not going to use those. I'm going to make my own. Research shows that there is no improvement in performance by making your own notes. All it does is take a whole lot of your time. So strategy number one is use what's given to you it's not, it, it doesn't help to make your own. Number two, um, in preparing for an exam, practice problems versus reviewing your notes. Uh, and most students will spend time going over the notes that they wrote and review their notes. Um, research shows that that doesn't do anything for you. It does not improve your performance um, versus doing practice problems. So if you take a group of students and you say, okay, you review the notes and you don't review the notes, but you do practice problems, huge statistical difference between the two groups. The ones that do practice problems perform far better and it is statistically significant at a very high level. So it is far better saying, you know, I, get, I got this stack of notes. I'm going to review my notes before I do practice problems because for some reason people don't want to get the problems wrong. When they're doing them, they don't want to do the practice problems until they think they're going to get them all right. Well, that's the wrong way to approach it. Make your mistakes in the problems. It's okay. 
It's okay if you're doing problems and you're only getting 30 or 40 percent of them. You learn better when you do it wrong. You learn better when you make mistakes because you have something to correct. You have something to remember. You have something to learn. But when you get them all right, well, there's nothing to learn out of that. You've got them all right. So when it comes time to uh, uh, think about should I do problems now or should I review, jump right into the problems. The sooner you jump right into the problems, the better it is. Uh, so I have structured the uh, uh, our, or at least what, what I do, in such a way to get you to the problems as fast as possible. So the videos go LOS by LOS. I explain everything for understanding. You have the notes beside you already printed out. Uh, so you don't have to make your own. You can listen. You can pay attention. From the start of a video to the end, for most readings, I can get you to the problems within two hours, hour and a half, two hours. Um, after a while, you can start listening to the videos at 1.5 times speed. Um, and you won't lose any, any understanding or any content. And you'll get through the video faster. The goal is to get you to the quizzes and to get you to the end of chapter problems as fast as possible because that's where the learning and the reinforcement happens. Don't waste your time making your own notes. When you're ready uh, uh, to prepare for the exam, don't waste your time reviewing your notes. I mean, you can have your review notes with you. You can look them over uh, uh, from time to time, but don't make that your goal. That's not preparing for the exam. Sure, review every now and then, but the majority of your time, and when I say the majority, 75 to 80 percent of your prep time for the exam, when you decide to go into review mode, should be doing problems, practice problems, mock exams. CFAI under Candidate Resources gives you a bunch of questions already. They give you, uh, I think, three or four uh, mock exams. With our packages, you get four full mock exams. Uh, we have lots of quizzes and questions on our site, and we keep adding more every single week. Uh, we had, I think, close to close to 70, uh, 75 or 100 new questions every single week come into our site uh, because that's where it happens. That's where the real preparation and the real uh, 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 separation happens is, is doing the practice problems. Um, let's look at uh, uh, some of the other things I have here. Um, number three, pay attention to the LOS statements. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you don't need to know. There are some sections of the readings that are just that are just not important. They're not part of the LOS statement. Look at the keyword in the LOS statement. If it doesn't use the word calculate, uh, then you don't have to worry about any formulas in that particular section. And there are quite a few in quant, uh, level one and at level two, uh, that uh, you'll go through a whole reading of formula after formula, and there might only be one word one LOS that uses the word calculate. That means there's only one formula you really need to know out of all of that reading. So at level one, if you go to, I believe it's hypothesis testing, or it's one of the or probability distributions. I'm not sure which one it is. There's only one LOS that has the word calculate in that whole reading. Only one has the word calculate. But there's about 30 formulas in that reading, but only one calculate. You only have to know one formula. On the exam, CFAI will not go outside of the LOS statement. So if an LOS statement says discuss, and there happens to be formulas in that section, they will not ask you to calculate anything. So don't waste your time trying to memorize a formula for skewness or kurtosis. It's not needed. And those are big, ugly formulas, and it's not needed. Don't waste your time with pooled variance and that kind of stuff. There's no calculate word there. It's not needed. At level two, you look at the uh, reading on time series. Yeah, it's long and it's kind of difficult to understand. But there is only one calculate word, only one out of that whole reading. You don't have to calculate anything. It's all interpret. So pay attention to the LOS statements because that's what the exam is. So how to prepare, when you go to a reading, you look at the LOS statements, look at LOSA and read it, and ask yourself, can I answer that? Can I just answer that right now without even looking at the reading? Can I, do I remember that? So it might say, uh, discuss the difference between A and B. And you might be able to say, oh, I know that. A is this and B is that. A is this and B is that. And you might be able to list three or four characteristics of each. Well, there you go. That's it. That's the essence of the LOS. Uh, which brings me to point four. Try teaching to an invisible other person. So when you're looking at LOSA from a reading and you read it, 
Uh, rather than try to remember it in your head, pretend there's somebody on the other side of the desk from you and explain, just explain it to them. You will never learn more than when you try to teach it to somebody else. Because to teach it, you must understand it on a different level. Uh, you understand it on a deeper level. So if you really want to understand something complex, try to explain it to someone else. And a neat little strategy to follow is this. Um, sit in front of your computer uh, and turn whatever um, screen recording software you use. Uh, turn that on and say LOSA and read the LOS and then explain it in two to three minutes. Uh, what you'll end up doing is creating a whole video library of you teaching yourself what all of these things are. Then when you get to review mode, rewatch your videos and ask yourself, do I understand what this guy's telling me? Because you'll forgot, you'll have forgotten most of what you uh, said on the video, but just listen to yourself like, trying to explain it and ask yourself, if I didn't know what I was, what this guy was saying, could I understand it? And if you, if you can, then you, then you got it. Uh, if you can teach it to someone else, you end up understanding on a level that, uh, that, that you wouldn't get if you just tried to repeat uh, what was written on a screen saying, okay, well, this means this, this means that. But try to teach it to some invisible other person. And finally, um, if you are having trouble with a, uh, uh, with a particular concept, try this. Try writing out a multiple choice question. It's not as easy as you think. It's actually quite difficult to write out a multiple choice question. And when you start writing them out, you'll realize how difficult it is because you have to come up with options. You have to ask a question that other people can understand. Find a study partner and say, look, I'm going to write 10 multiple choice questions for this reading and you're going to write 10 and we're going to switch. And uh, you'll read the other 10 that they wrote and you'll say, okay, well, this is a wrong question. You wrote it wrong. It could have two answers. You will learn more in writing a question and grading other people's questions than just trying to do it on your own. This, now you're actually applying the knowledge towards something. And the, the something is teaching, but you'd be surprised how much you learn doing that. So these are great ways of taking something that uh, uh, seemed inert, something that just looked like words on a page. And if something looks easy, you read LOSA, you say, okay, I know this. Well, try it. Teach it to yourself and then write one multiple choice question on it just to see how well you know it. You'll remember it. Not only that, you'll build a whole library of videos of, of you teaching yourself and you'll have a whole bunch of multiple choice questions that you've written. So when you go into review, you can try some of your own questions to see if you wrote them well. And you'll find that correcting your own mistakes teaches you even more. So there's a lot here that, uh, that you can do. In the books themselves, uh, there are the blue box examples. There's the end of chapter questions. Do them all, especially those blue box examples. They go nice and slow through everything. Uh, and they give you a whole bunch of different uh, scenarios uh, uh, to, to get to some really good understanding. We offer quizzes. There are different Q banks out there. CFAI has a question bank for you. Uh, there are mocks. We give you mocks. CFAI gives you mocks. The end of chapter questions, blue box examples. When you do the blue box examples as well, try not to look at the answer. Try to work your way through it. Uh, and you don't have to get it right. You don't have to wait until you know you're going to get a question right before you attempt it. Don't be afraid of getting them wrong because no one's looking, no one's watching, no one's grading them. Get them wrong. Uh, it's not uh, uh, demoralizing to get them wrong. It is actually a great strategy because you will learn more in making the mistake than in getting it right. The reason is this. You get it right. Oh, I got it right. You move on. Uh, maybe you got it right by guessing. Maybe if you read the answer and you said, oh, I didn't, I didn't get it right because of that reason. I got it right because of faulty, a faulty understanding. I just happened to get it right. Well, if the question were asked in a different way, you might not get it right. But when you get it wrong, why did I get it wrong? Now you got to question yourself. You got to read the answer. You got to think about it. You got to go back to the book going saying, wait a minute, though, that doesn't make any sense because over here it's written. Oh, hang on. There it is right there. You end up doing a little bit more work. The wrong answer pushes you to verify, in fact, that you were wrong. So you end up actually learning more when you get questions wrong. Uh, I seem to think that textbooks should be written backwards, that all the questions should be at the front of the textbook first, that you should have to try to answer all the questions first, then read. Because when you're reading for answers, they become obvious. But when you're reading for information and you don't know what the questions are yet, you don't know what to read for. So I think that reading the questions over first and then reading the content 
or watching the video is more powerful because suddenly you have a whole bunch of questions in your mind and the answers will just pop out at you. Uh, answers are everywhere, uh, but if you don't have the questions in your mind, you can't answer them. Uh, so combine everything that, that we've just talked about. Good time management. Uh, learn uh, the content by seeking understanding and not just memorization. Have a strategy that takes all of this other stuff that's useless out of the way, making notes, reviewing your notes. Pay attention to those LOS statements. Look at the keyword. See if you can answer it. Most LOS statements can be answered in two to three minutes. Really, if you if you look at the, at the beginning of the reading and you look at the LOS statement, in about two to three minutes, you should be able to repeat exactly what that answer is. So uh, a reading with uh, 10 LOS statements, 20 to 30 minutes, you should be able to, to repeat uh, uh, exactly what uh, each of those LOS statements are trying to do. And again, if it doesn't have the word calculate, don't write down the formula. It's not needed. Uh, and again, the uh, teaching and the writing questions, uh, that's a very powerful way uh, to, to gain understanding. So with that, uh, that being said, if uh, you have any questions, I'll answer them.